Hello, everybody. Welcome to Doggy Zones Ask the Trainer Live this evening. We've got a bunch of people jumping in and still joining here, so we'll get started in just a second. We were uh, sitting thinking about uh, how many of you showed up early for the call and laughing. It's probably the same group that shows up early to class. So for those of you that are showing up early, we definitely appreciate that. And uh, the rest of you uh, that are on time, well, appreciate you being here. So uh, it's great to have everybody on. We're going to go ahead and dive into things here. Uh, real quick, just for those of you who are new to the call here, uh, we are recording this call so that people can see this later. Um, we'll have the replay available on YouTube sometime in the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, this program that we are using called Ring Central Meetings operates very similar to Zoom. It is the same platform with a different label on it. So you can certainly use the chat feature below. Uh, we were, are going to encourage you to do that. Um, and if you're on a mobile device, you'll need to go to the participants button and that will allow you to get into the chat area. Um, so before we uh, go ahead and move into things here, uh, let's just do a real quick check-in and have those of you who are familiar with the chat bar, go ahead and tell us what you did with your dog in the rain today. Let's see what you did with your dog in the rain today. Treat and train. Uh-oh, somebody got a manners minder. And manners minder is the same thing as treat and train. That's awesome. Great. Got her what? Let her play. All right. Got soaked. Two walks in the rain. Dedicated dog owners. Bravo. We are so proud of you for going out and getting wet in the rain. Great job. Andrew, Great job. Andrew, yeah. this is Christine. How do you type? How, how are they typing in? Do you use um, the chat thing? Yep. Just use the chat bar. Okay. So you can click that and then type in. Oh, I see. Thank you. Yep. Okay. You got it. Okay, so we are going to um, go ahead and uh, just do a real quick introduction here. We've got a number of people on the call with us here. Um, this evening, we've got Jessica, Candice, Milton, Karen, George, Terrence, all on here with us. And uh, we are changing it up. We have a couple different trainers answering questions this evening. Um, Jessica and Karen will be the two people answering questions. And uh, so just real quick, uh, Jessica, give us a quick introduction and a uh, fun fact about you. Okay, everybody. For those who don't know me, my name is Jessica Hudgens, and I am the training team lead of the Doggy Zones training department. And I've been with Doggy Zone since before it was in Rockville. Um, fun fact about me, um, during this quarantine, um, I have been learning how to play the harmonica. Learning to play the harmonica. So yeah. do you have that with you? Do you think like at some point you can play a song and we can I, see how everybody's dogs react? Maybe I, we'll come up with a cool uh, way for you to help calm everybody's dogs playing the harmonica. I, I, I might consider that a little bit later on in the call. <laughs> all right. All right. And Karen. Hi, I'm Karen Vogel. I've been with Doggy Zone for almost four years now been training for about a dozen years and fun fact about me is travel is my passion and I've been to every continent in the world except for Antarctica Ooh. probably about 90 to 100 of the major countries and cities out there and uh, it's killing me that I can't travel right now <laughs> you and so many other people Karen <laughs> Well, without further ado, we will go ahead and dive into things. We are going to change up our format a little bit here this evening. Um, you know, in the past, we've used pre-submitted questions for the entire call. Um, and what we're going to do this time is we're going to just answer a few pre-submitted questions. And then from there, what we'll be doing is we'll be just opening it up for you all to ask questions live. Um, so we'll either have you put it into the chat bar, uh, we'll unmute you and we'll go ahead and kind of go through that with you. So, uh, should be a little bit different format here, but hopefully a little bit more fun for everybody and, uh, just change it up a little bit. So, um, let's go ahead and start off with our first question here. Uh, our dog likes to dig at our furniture rug and us. Hmm, that's, I, I have to imagine that's painful. I hope that their nails are short. Uh, while I do want her to be comfortable, I also don't want her to thin out the fabric or have claw marks. How do we get her to stop? Jessica, this sounds painful. It, it does um, sound 
Yeah, it does sound painful, but being that, and, and for those of you who have met Little Buckshot, my dachshund, um, I understand what it's like to have a dog that wants to dig all the time. Um, it's a very natural thing for him. But for me, when he starts to dig on the furniture or on the carpet, um, I don't mind him getting comfortable. But yes, there is a point to where en enough is enough. And part of that is having a really good um, way to redirect the dog. So whether it's, um, you know, correcting him with a, um, an out or a houch and telling him to go to place or to come and lay down. Uh, it's really, really been beneficial to help redirect him with something more preferable. Now, if he's digging on me, for instance, which he will do on cue, so maybe I'll have to take a video of that at some point in time, um, it, it can't hurt. So for that, we might want to remove him from the situation, maybe get him off the bed, put him on the floor, so then he's not doing that and hurting or harming anyone in the process. But that dachshund, man, he loves to dig. <laughs> Excellent. And Karen, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I agree with Jess and she made some great points. I think the only thing I would add to that is just be careful that you're not reinforcing the behavior you don't want. So as the dog starts scratching on the couch or scratching on you or the rug and you're running over and saying no and doing all this stuff, you're actually maybe reinforcing that instead of doing the opposite, trying to stop that behavior. So just make sure you're not, not reinforcing it. Like Jeff said, redirect them quickly, get them in some training and uh, you know, get their minds off of that and then start to teach them, hey, if you wanna go up on the couch, then it's a cue and you're invited up only instead of letting them go up and do that whenever they want. Yeah, I like the the point of, you know, putting it on cue of when they're allowed up on the couch. Um, so many people ask me, you know, how do I get my dog to, you know, not jump on on guests? And, you know, so often of the time it's when they're sitting on the couch and it's because they let the dog jump on and off the couch at all times. And really mm -hmm. um, what I encourage uh, most families to do is go ahead and teach your dog to stay off of the couch completely create complete clarity in the line, but they're never allowed to just make the arbitrary decision to jump up onto a couch. And then once they've completely gotten clear on that rule, then put it on command. And a lot of this issue, I think, will be eliminated just by, you know, getting her off of that. You might even consider um, putting um, together a bed for her that's got, you know, uh, kind of a wall to it that you can put blankets in. Um, so this way uh, she nests because it sounds like she's the type of dog that might like a nesting type of behavior. And so you might find some ways to um, allow her to do that behavior in a more productive way or that doesn't necessarily affect you all. So uh, hopefully that helped, Melissa. Uh, let's go ahead and dive into uh, question number two. Help with puppy nipping and housebreaking. Any tips apart from following the schedule? Um, how do you tell the difference between an accident and marking multiple submissions on this topic? Okay, so, you know, we ultimately, uh, before we dive into this, this is kind of two different pieces. So um, puppy nipping is one thing and housebreaking is a separate. So let's go ahead and uh, focus on the housebreaking for this one for starters, because that's where these other questions kind of come in and then we'll follow up with the uh, nipping, Jessica. Okay, yeah, so with, and it looks like with the question, um, it sounds like the, this guest was on the previous call where we talked about um, having a good schedule. I believe, this, if I'm correct, it was the same person we sent the house training tip sheet to. Um, so it sounds like getting the dog on the schedule is a really, really good um, assistance for them in this process. But in the, in the big picture, when we're talking about the, the house training, um, we want to make sure that we're able to have good management of the dog. Um, there's a big difference when we're talking about an accident versus marking. Um, in a virtual lesson earlier this morning, a client and I were talking about this exact topic and making sure that the owners were paying attention to what the dog's activity, like, activity level was like in between the intake of water and their elimination break. Uh, so if we can focus on um, what the dog's doing, keeping them around, having them drag a leash around, then we can control the environment a little bit better. And then from there, we can guide the dog outside when it does need to go to the bathroom. I'll be at this morning, it's been raining all day. And we took that into consideration with a couple of the accidents that they had this morning. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, and, and I would add to that, and those were great points. Uh, again, I, we can't stress enough about managing your dog and, and making sure that 
you know, if they're free and loose around the house and they're active and they're a young puppy, um, you know, you're going to run into some of those accidents. Uh, managing them a little bit more closely around, knowing when they need to go out and getting them out before they go is, is important. One of the first cues I always teach my dogs is the relief cue. So I cue number one differently, I cue uh, number two, and uh, so the dog over repetition learns that, you know, they, they go outside. And uh, it'll help you too on those rainy days when you want them to just go and then get done and get in the house instead of having to drag them around, walk them around for an hour, waiting for them to go to the bathroom. And make sure they, they do that first and then take them out and do a nice walk or a little play or something fun. So they start to understand that if they go outside, it's rewarding and not go inside. Excellent. Um, I'm getting some uh, messages that are sent directly to me, but I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not going to be able to respond to them very well. So if you can just go ahead and put them in the general chat bar, we've got Milton watching. Um, and we can uh, make sure that we get those uh, when we finish up with these questions here. I just don't want to miss anything that you guys are asking. So um, thank you you both for uh, for sharing all that and just out of curiosity if you all could type into the chat bar for us how many of your dogs don't like going to the bathroom in the rain uh, how many of you have dogs that are porch dwellers and will wait all day long or till the next day before they go to the bathroom I'm just curious uh, so go ahead and throw that into the chat bar while we dive into our next question here um, next question is, how do we keep our dog from begging for food at the dinner table? Front paws on my husband or edge of the table mm -hmm. and keeping him from scratching at the cabinet to get a tent more food. This is from Dawn. Wow. So it sounds like during mealtime, this dog loves to be involved. And I would beg to, to ask if anyone had ever given scraps of food to the dog at the dinner table. So that would be question number one. I see Harley's mom shaking her head over there. Um, so I, I think a, a couple of things need to happen. Um, one, at dinner time, does the dog know that he's not supposed to put his paws up on the table? Does he think that he deserves a spot or, or, or has earned a spot at that table with the family? Um, and you might consider, um, depending on the level of training that the dog has, um, putting them in a place and a down and a stay on the bed. Um, making it an activity. That's what we do with our dogs is that we have them lay down and stay a little bit away from the table and use that as a good opportunity for training. Uh, but if the dog doesn't know a place or a down and a stay, um, that trusty old exercise that we call sit on the dog, where you put your butt on the leash and get that dog to settle and relax and calm down with you, um, that is the best way to help that dog figure out what it's exactly supposed to be doing at that point in time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess that maybe this, this pup doesn't know he's not supposed to um, be eaten at the table. Well, um, that's great, Jessica, and I hope that all of you all are able to hear Jessica. I know I've gotten a couple messages about her audio being a little on the fritz here, but um, uh, I hopefully you guys are getting that here. So, uh, Karen, you want to go ahead and add to that? Uh, the only thing I'd add, because Jess really hit the, the key points there, you know, if, if you can't, uh, if you want to just have a nice leisurely dinner and not worry about the dog, it's always great to put them in a crate <laughs> and put them in containment. Nothing wrong with having your dogs um, be in their, their den while you're eating. In fact, it's probably the best thing for some of you all because, well, we'll just say this. It's not always easy to um, do two things at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and training your dog and eating is not possible. Okay, um, I know some of you think it might be possible to eat and train your dog simultaneously, usually not until your dog's in the higher levels. Um, so thinking about your three pillars of management, you either contain the dog, uh, like Karen said, put them in the crate, which is ultimately, if that crate's in an area that's right near where you're eating, then you're training the dog by default, by putting them in there, they're learning to relax and settle without you all being engaging with them. Um, or you have the option of the sit on the dog exercise, like Jess said, but you definitely need to exercise those.
three pieces. That's definitely critical. So the next question that we have here is our pups sometimes have sporadic jumping, where if a guest comes over and pets them right away, they'll be angels. But if guests shy away at all or doesn't pet them, they will jump and paw. Wanted to know how to stop this, especially since it's not a common occurrence. This is from Melody. So Jessica, tell us, uh, what do you think is uh, going on here? Uh, I don't know if Jessica's actually there or not. So Karen, why don't you go ahead and then uh, Jessica can move up. Yeah. Um, so uh, it, it really is um, a good opportunity to work on the sit and implied stay when that happens. You have to assume that your dog is going to jump because you don't know when they're going to do it, when they're not going to do it. You don't know what their reaction is going to be to certain people or certain dogs. So while you're in training still and you want that dog to be reliable, I would just say assume that they're going to jump, get them into a sit-stay, and start to practice where people come up and keep a mindful eye on them to make sure they stay in that sit. And then as they walk away, you know, really reward them and keep doing that, keep doing that so that guests or people or dogs can come closer and closer to the dog and they'll stay. But you got to build that up and just assume they're going to jump until they're, they're more reliable. Excellent. Uh, I'm not sure if Jessica, are you uh, good audio here? Let's see. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I think your screen's just frozen, but talk away to us. Okay, I'll talk away to you guys. Um, it sounds like in these moments when guests are coming over um, that we need, and, and Karen hit the nail on the head of, of managing the dog a little bit, working on that sit stay is great. Again, using any of those pillars of management that we've always taught between um, containing the dog, having the dog on the leash, or teaching the dog what to do in those moments are going to help ad address the issue of what the dog is not doing. Um, if we can teach him what to do, then he, he can't always um, do the wrong thing. Um, and especially since it's not a common occurrence and it's not necessarily um, triggered by something um, that we can figure out. Um, we just wanna be able to be very, very um, engaged in those moments and, and help the dog in the process. Yeah, and you know, just to add a little piece to this here, I think that when you have a dog that is being good, if a guest pets them right away and doesn't behave well when guests kind of ignore them, um, then, you know, what's going on there is the dog is exercising different behaviors um, to see what they can do to get a response. Um, this is something similar to what we would call an extinction burst. It's a psychology term for those of you that are really familiar with psychology. It's kind of like you go to a vending machine and you put money into the vending machine and you hit, you know, C2. And when you hit C2, your candy comes out. Well, it comes out nine out of 10 times and you get reinforced very regularly for that happening. So when it doesn't come out, and your candy gets stuck, what's the first thing that you do? Put it into the chat bar. What's the first thing that you do when the candy gets stuck? This is gonna be really interesting. Some people are gonna have some interesting responses. Some people say a, a choice word, break the glass, hit the machine. Yeah, see some of you, um, you go from zero to 60 like this. Um, what generally happens is there's a progression, right? You go, oh darn, the candy didn't come out. And then you tap the side of the machine and then you go, you know what, let me hit it just a little bit harder, and then it moved. The candy moved. It, 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 it might come out. I might get it. And then all of a sudden, you've got the, the machine, and you're rocking it back and forth, and then all of a sudden, you go, you know what, my candy's not coming out. I'm going to get arrested if somebody sees this, and you walk away, and you eventually give up. Well, when somebody comes over and ignores the dog, this is what's happening. The dog's now going, okay, I've got to try everything that I can think of to figure out how to get attention because what I know normally works is now not working. And so at that point you have to make a decision is the dog not is the person not comfortable with the dog or what do I need to do to manage the situation. So just something to add in there to that. Um, the next question that we have is Lily hasn't worn her e-collar in a few weeks. Uh oh uh, what's the best way to get her back into using it, Diane? 
Oh man. Um, so there's, there's a couple of different things um, that, that Diane could do with Lily. Um, one, I would, I would love, I'll say, I would love to schedule virtual lessons so we can work on this because that's probably step number one is make sure we're reintroducing it correctly. Um, being able to um, go back and remember how we do what's called loading the collar, um, finding the appropriate low level for the dog and, and working on that tap, treat, tap, treat, uh, tap and treat until the dog um, can become a little bit re um, re-engaged with the with the remote training collar. Um, it sounds like um, we've kind of jumped off the the wagon of training a little bit on on certain ends. Um, so we want to definitely get her back comfortable with using it. Excellent, Karen. You want to add to anything to that? Yeah, no, that was excellent. And I just remember that even if you're not using it, you should always have the collar on every day. So as soon as Lily's out of her crate, put the collar on and be ready, you know, have it when you do training, but keep the collar on because what you want to avoid is that you want to want to avoid Lily only performing the cues when you go and get that collar and put it on. So if they all, she always has it on, then she never knows, you know, when you're going to start that training and, and you have the ability to reinforce it. Also, for safety reasons, God forbid she ever were to get out, you have a way to get it back. Yeah, I, I agree completely with, with Karen. Excellent. And, and, and the last question to answer here. Go ahead. Oh, no, I'm you're sorry. fine. I was just going to okay. say, go ahead. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I think we just keep missing each other here. So we're going to go ahead and move forward and then we will go into our live questions here after this last question here. So Pixie is starting to get very aggressive or excuse me, very possessive of me. Every time my boyfriend or even a family member kisses me, she lunges towards me and pushes the other person away from me and barks. She has known my boyfriend and family since the day she came home. How do I break this? Jessica. Okay, so it sounds like um, there's a couple of behaviors that Pixie's exhibiting, um, even um, for, for people that she is comfortable with and knows. Um, in times where a dog is being um, possessive or kind of guarding behavior, um, we really want to look at um, what we're telling Pixie to do in those moments, okay? Um, if we're allowing her to lunge and jump, um, it sounds like she's just trying to figure out what her best options are in those moments. And it, it also sounds like, it, I, I believe it was the question from Melody, where we talked about the sporadic jumping behavior, um, regardless of whether it's jumping out of excitement or lunging for reactivity or some sort of aggression. Um, again, we want to teach the dog what to do in those moments. Uh, so again, giving the dog an option of a correct behavior, like a sit, stay, um, go to your place, um, and holding those positions will allow the dog to work themselves out of those adrenalized states. Karen. Yeah, I, I think, you know, you, you a lot of times see in a fear or anxious dog this kind of possessive behavior. It can turn, you know, it's probably been happening with Pixie for a while, but you haven't noticed some of the signs or maybe, you know, you just didn't see it um, <clears throat> or recognize it, but it's probably ha been happening for a while. And uh, that possessiveness typically will uh, be with a female, you know, with an owner that's a female. And, uh, and what happens with a, a fear, anxious dog is if they're allowed to kind of do what they want, um, they just don't have the confidence. Um, and so they start to, and it's very self-satisfying for them. Um, to maybe it was first hide under the leg and then they felt safe, then that didn't work. So then they start lunging and then the bad thing goes away. So they start to learn to learn behavior to say, I'm fearful of all these things. I haven't been, you know, you haven't helped them to be confident. So then they just start to do these, these exhibit these behaviors. 
And that can lead to growling and then biting if those things that they're fearful of don't go away. So again, it goes back to what Jess was saying, you know, really working the dog, training them, and giving them boundaries so they can't do all of that, start to make them confident through training, and then introduce these things like the boyfriend, family members, and then outside while they're in training so they understand what they have, you know, should be doing. And you start to desensitize them and build up their confidence so they don't start doing that lunging anymore. Yeah, there's a lot of different uh, layers to this one. I'm sure if we really peeled back the onion on this, there'd probably be, you know, a bit more to it that, you know, we would need to probably talk through. But, you know, ultimately to deal with this type of thing, um, you know, I don't look at it as you know, breaking the issue or stopping the issue. It's more of teaching the dog a different set of uh, behaviors that we want them to follow in a specific scenario. So I think about the scenario of me, you know, going to give somebody a hug. I think about, well, what do I want my dog to do in this scenario? And we practice that routine and we train that scenario as much as possible. So um, those are all uh, great, great questions and great feedback from the trainers as well. So we're going to go ahead and kind of switch gears here. Perfect timing. We're about halfway through. And what we're going to do here is we're going to go ahead and we're going to open it up for you all to go ahead and ask questions. Um, so if you have a question, um, some of you may know how to uh, do the raise hand feature. Um, you can also put something down into the chat bar for us. And if we see a hand go up, we'll try to get it and unmute you or we will take a question from the chat bar here and see what kind of questions we can get answered. I know that uh, somebody, I think it might have been Diane, was maybe had a question uh, on the second to last question. Let's see here. Hey, Andrew, we should also go back and, and answer the puppy nipping. I know we talked about house training, but we, we might want to. Yeah, you want to go ahead and, uh, and, and talk on that? Sure. So uh, with puppy nipping, you know, there's a difference between nipping and, and biting, chewing. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, it's a, a chewing and um, is a natural thing for your dogs. They need, you know, you want to give them uh, appropriate chew toys, bones to, to chew on because they all have to do that, especially puppies as they're teething and, and teeth are falling out. Um, but the, the nipping and the biting tend to be more of, hey, I want your attention, I want control, I want to disrupt you, <clears throat> and so you want to be able to avoid that. There are a couple of ways you can do that. One is use a disruptor, and many of you have heard all of our trainers, you know, us say, ouch, you know, like a bark, and that can help your dog, you know, you're communicating like another dog, get them to stop that nipping with that disruption and then redirect them to what they should be chewing. Uh, if that continues and you, that dogs, you know, sometimes houch doesn't work for the dog, um, you can go as far as if they nip you, easy way to stop that, you bring them right to the crate, you put them in, and uh, what you're telling your dog is, you can't be with me if you nip or bite us. And that will help you to quickly turn that around and then wait and let them out and get them on the leash. If they go back to nipping you again, put them back into the crate. So that can quickly turn that around pretty fast. Yeah, I think the key just to add into that is putting the dog into the crate is to not have to be disciplining the dog. I think a lot of the times people think of putting the dog into the crate as, uh, you know, being punishment or uh, negative towards the dog, but it's really just giving them a second to, uh, to kind of pause. Um, so think of it more of just as a pause to just kind of relax without any stimulation, uh, whether that be by design or by default. Um, 
looks like we got a few questions that are coming in here. Uh, the first question that I see here is recent thunderstorm uh, after puppy was asleep caused him to wake up and act scared, trembling, hiding, and then wanted to bark and howl. Suggestions on how we don't reinforce this behavior. Jessica. Yeah, so I'll go ahead and, and jump in on this one. Um, so it's, it's hard to not react in um, a, a kind of sometimes a coddling manner when the dogs are showing uh, visible signs of distraught or distress. Um, in something like a loud noise or a thunderstorm, um, especially if, if the puppy was asleep. Um, in, in the best way of handling this, um, so we don't reinforce the bad behavior, again, think about um, something we can do to help calm or soothe the dog. Um, anytime that we have a dog that's in an adrenalized state, we wanna work as quickly as possible um, to allow the dog to learn how to settle and soothe. Um, I might consider, um, you know, doing that sit on the dog exercise to allow the dog to learn how to calm down and relax. Um, or on the other side, depending on the, the behavior of the dog, you might consider doing some, um, some engagement exercises with the dog. Um, you know, whether that's working on a, a recall or a, the name game um, or teaching the dog to go in and out of the kennel on cue. Um, sometimes you just need to refocus that dog into something a little bit more active um, to get their mind off of what, what's occurring. Um, it, it can definitely be a challenge, um, but again, re remembering to teach the dog what to do in those moments is going to benefit you far out than, than anything else. Um, and on the flip side of that as well, um, if the dog is sensitive to loud noises and thunderstorms, our old Labrador that we used to have, I used to have to bunker him downstairs um, with my son and turn on some music. He was in like the quietest room of the house just to allow the dog to learn how to settle and relax. He was, he was pretty shy with loud noises. Excellent. Karen? Yeah, and now's a really good opportunity while you're all at home to, you know, uh, start to socialize, especially puppies and young dogs you know, get some noises to happen, get out the vacuum cleaner, get some different uh, things that you can bang together. And of course, you don't want to go to your dog and like bang it right in their face. But, you know, again, start to introduce them much like we do in our puppy classes to, you know, different objects, different things, maybe a little bit of a sound and then make that louder and louder so you start to desensitize and socialize your your dogs to all these different noises so that you know you can clap stuff really loud and your dog thinks it's no big deal so that when that next um and it's all positive and when they're nice and quiet you know you're treating them and it's all good so that when that next storm comes and they hear that thunder they're like ah no big deal I I wish I could um, remember the story. I think this is a story that I heard from George, and um, I'll probably butcher it here, but I'll do my best to just share it real quickly, which was a family uh, who taught their dog to place uh, on, their on their dog bed. And every time that there was a thunderstorm, um, they would teach the dog to go to place. Um, and there was some very awful natural disaster that this person experienced where uh, there was a massive storm and the dog was found after the storm with the roof ripped off the house, still sitting on its, on its bed in place. Um, I think there's something to be said for if you have a dog that shows fear uh, of a certain type of environmental factor, like a thunderstorm, to have a really, really consistent routine that you're gonna follow uh, with them so they know what to expect um, and do everything that you can to create a positive association with it, whether that's using frozen Kongs with peanut butter in it or whatever the case may be when you're putting them on their bed, um, but try to get that routine in place. Um, let's go ahead, we're gonna dive into the next question so we can get through as many as possible for you all this evening. Uh, this one is uh, coming about Gigi, how to stop Gigi's tendency to want to lick people she meets. She's training to be a therapy dog and that behavior is not a cool thing. 
So no. uh, tell us, Jessica, what do we, what do we need to work on here? Um, so there's a, there's a couple of different things you want to work on, obviously. And I saw George uh, chat it through the, through the chat bar as well. She can't um, lick on somebody and sit at the same time. Um, so part of that is, is teaching the appropriate greeting. And, and I know Gigi can do this because she, she passed her CGC exam. Um, so she knows that how to, how to sit politely for greeting, but it's at what point does the licking start to occur? Um, in order to teach the dog to do that less, we wanna think about being able to remove the hands before the licking starts and also pay attention to how she's being pet. Um, and elongated, you know, like caress and petting will allow the dog to start to enjoy that. And then from there, she's going to start licking because that's, she's a happy-go-lucky Labrador. That's what they do. Um, but really being able to work on the elongation of time that she's able to sit politely for that greeting um, without licking, pawing, um, laying down, or anything opposite than just sitting politely for that greeting. Right. Excellent. Karen, you want to add anything to that? The only thing I would add is that's another good example where you could cue the, the kiss, the licking as a kiss. And that way, you know, combined with what Jess just said, then you're able to say, okay, give them a kiss. It's one lick and it's controlled and that's it. And everything else is you're sitting there nice and quietly. Now, I'm not sure that everybody on here has context, uh, but Gigi is a Labrador, so that is three quarters of the problem here. Um, so I just wish you wish you luck on uh, on on working through that one. I'm no, I'm, I'm kind of kidding, but no, the advice is good advice. But um, I think the the withdrawing the attention from her when she starts the licking behavior is going to be going to be the big thing that you need to do there. Uh, having three three Labradors myself, I gave up. It was the easier choice for me. I'm not saying you should do what I did. Anyways, we're going to go ahead and keep moving here. Uh, looking through exercise besides the middle school drills was about to start high school when lockdown occurred. Uh, any suggestions? So Jessica, you know the um, the criteria and the curriculum pretty well. Uh, what can um, what can Melinda be um, you know starting to think about going into high school? So if if you think about in, in the middle school program, we're shaping more of the the heel position and starting to get the dogs to come into that left or that right hand side, whichever side you're teaching it on, um, and being able to walk with the dog a lot more attentively. Um, that's one of the big things, the big jump between middle school and high school. And I've I've told a lot of people this in the classes is that the dog has to want to choose you over whatever the distraction is when you're moving throughout the world. Um, so I, I think a big focus on leash work is starting to shape that heel in motion is important. Um, and if you don't remember how to do that, um, maybe that's a, a virtual lesson we can set up or maybe a demonstration on, an, on another call. Um, to be able to get that dog to choose you, choose your instructions over whatever the compelling social distractions are in the environment. Um, when going through, um, we, wanted, we wanna teach the dogs where to give all of that effort and attention on. Um, that's the biggest jump that I would recommend and being that we are all um, social distancing at this point in time, it's the perfect opportunity to work your dogs around some distractions like people, other dogs, being able to go to the park because those times where normally people would approach you and want to say hi to your dogs, they, they can't or they shouldn't be. Um, so you have a really good opportunity to work those attention and focus skills and get those at a higher, higher level. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Karen, you want to add anything to that? I would just say practice a little bit more to you being some distance from your dog. So put them on place and be about, you know, start 10 feet away, then 15, then 20 feet and start to work them in down sits so that you don't have to be on top of them all the time, getting them to sit and work that distance because that'll help as well. Excellent. 
Um, those two ladies right there know the curriculum much better than I do, even though I was part of putting it together. Uh, they are the ones that deliver it to you all on a regular basis. So I'm going to leave that one to them. But I will say, like you probably heard me say on a previous phone call, advanced skills are basics that you've mastered. So if you are thinking, oh, I want to move on and do something more advanced, you should probably go back to the beginning and take what it is that you first learned in the very beginning and really push it and challenge it and test it uh, with lots of distraction and things of that nature because that's what's really going to help you progress a bit faster. Uh, the next question that we got here is uh, when to use the e-collar. Uh, Harper tends to stop and scratch at it. Uh, is, is that too high or too low a of a level or too tight or too loose or plain lack of training on my part? Well, Matthew, let's, uh, let's see what we got here for you. Jessica, uh, what do we have to help Harper out? Oh, a lot of times a dog stopping and scratching at the collar tells me that Harper's probably a little bit confused of what you're asking. Um, it could be um, lack of consistent use of the collar. It could be too tight. It could be too loose. It could be too high. It could be too low. It, it's hard to know without the, the, the situation, really. Um, but, but being able to, as long as it's fitted properly and you've got the right level, so let's assume those two things are checked off correctly. Um, generally, when the dog stops and scratches, they're confused. They're being a little contentious, or maybe they just flat out don't want to do what you're requiring them. But a lot of times it's going to be based on the dogs having a lack of knowledge or confidence in, in order to follow through with what you're asking them. So if you're working on a, on a recall and the dog stops halfway and scratches, that could be defined a couple of different ways. Maybe the collar pressure was too much. Maybe it wasn't enough. I mean, it's, it really, really depends on, on kind of the situation that, that you're using it in. But you feel free to send, send a message over. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's who I think it is, which I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, we, we will, we will see, see that dog soon enough and uh, help them through it. Karen, did you want to add to that? Just to remember that as you're doing the e-collar training, to always make sure you still have the leash on because you never want to get to the point where you're jacking up that e-collar and, you know, making it a negative uh, situation for the dog. So, again, kind of get them out of that shaking and scratching because sometimes they're just saying, I'm going to blow you off. And you can reinforce it with a leash and kind of get them going again and then getting back into the training mode. So one of the questions that I would just ask you, Matt, is, is Harper scratching at the collar every time that you hit the button or is it happening intermittently? If it's happening every single time that you hit the button, chances are it's too low or too high. Um, or she has learned that by scratching at the collar that that ultimately interrupts yeah. what it is that you were asking from her. Yeah. And that is ultimately a situation that you have to be able to continue to enforce what it is that you're saying and not allow her to be rewarded by you stopping enforcing the command. I hope that that makes sense. Um, but that is most commonly uh, what I tend to see is that that is a, a large part of it. Um, if that's not the case, I would just, you know, try adjusting those levels a little bit. We always say it's, if it's too low, um, you know, then ultimately you can pretty easily figure it out. The dog's going to be pretty much blowing you off as soon as you put them around distraction. Um, and so you go up. But if you're getting any type of a startled response or if you're tapping that button and she's immediately scratching, I might say that it's too high. A collar really shouldn't be more, it shouldn't be a distraction to the dog. It should just be there to get their attention. Uh, there are situations that we can use it as an adversive, but nine out of 10 cases, we're probably not going to do that. I'm going to go ahead and jump on to the next uh, question here. Uh, let's see here. Leo gets nervous when I'm cooking. I think it's the sizzling sounds that make him tremble. 
Oh, poor Leo. Doesn't <laughs> like cooking. <laughs> uh, so that's really interesting. I'm wondering, does Leo get fed food during cooking? Mm. Daniela, does does he get does he get some food during cooking time? No, so I usually feed him while we're having dinner or after we've had dinner. But my kitchen's small and kind of open, so he's around while I'm cooking. And he's in there, and he's just sitting down looking at me. But when I start sautéing in the pan, you know, makes the sizzling sound, he just starts shaking. He won't, he won't really leave. It's when he goes and hides. If I grab, like, a paper, a plastic bag and, like, make it, you know, rustle, that's when he'll kind of go and run away. But if I'm cooking, he just stays there, but he shakes. Okay, excellent. Uh, Jessica, do you want to answer this one? Yeah, but, you know, it's similar. I had a similar issue with, with Little Buck early on, not with cooking, but with the vacuum cleaner. Um, anytime that we would run the vacuum cleaner, he would shake like a little leaf in the wind. Um, so what we started to do was to use that as an opportunity, and I, I engaged with my son with this, that he would do um, like recall drills, or he would use the, the Kong wobbler to get the dog used to, and that's another aspect of socialization, is socializing to sounds and noises, um, and really being able to engage the dog in something preferable, and then over time, it becomes background noise, um, but we have to also look at what are we telling the dog? What are we telling Leo to do in those moments where he's having this almost, I don't want to call it like a panic attack, but he's really uncertain about what's going on. You know, I'd, I'd consider, you know, putting a, you know, food out for him, maybe feeding him at that point in time or having somebody engage with him. So then he's learning to not um, have uncertainty in those moments. Karen, you want to add to that? Yeah, I think Jessica hit, hit everything just right. <laughs> All right, excellent. Uh, let's see here. I'm just uh, trying to find the uh, next question. I got so many uh, messages here. I think I've just like kind of lost it here. So um, let's see here. So Pixie out of the blue will just go into a frenzy, bite the blanket, nip and growl at me, usually while sitting on the couch trying to relax. What can oh, no. we do for Pixie? Oh no! So it's it, with Pixie when she's when she's running and zipping, zooming around. Um, you know, is there's a couple of things. If it's when everybody's settled and trying to relax, um, is she just trying to get her energy out? You know, depending on the age of the dog, is she getting like the witching hour, the puppy zoomies, um, as as we tend to call them? Um, what can we teach her to do in that moment? Again. If you're trying to, to sit on the couch, relax, and watch TV, that is a great opportunity um, to do that relaxation down, that sit on the dog exercise, to teach her how to just relax with you. Um, and again, putting that on, on cue, Karen was talking about cueing a lot of stuff earlier, um, cueing the dog to go run around and have the zoomies. Um, or getting the dog to just settle, relax nicely with you. So again, um, in, implore some of those management techniques that we, we harp on all the time about um, containment, leash management, or training in those moments. Mm -hmm. Karen? Yeah, I think, I think again, uh, with Pixie, that... Um, you know, behavior sometimes you see in a dog that's a little fear aggression, you know, aggressive. And, uh, and, and they can, you know, kind of even turn on, on you because they're just unsure. So again, as Jess said, you want to put them in a, a sit on the dog with the leash. You want to always manage them and not let them decide what, what is safe, what's not. They have to start, she has to start to understand that um, you as the owner are, are, can make it safer for her and not the other way around and let her make those decisions. So by you putting her into those positions in the sit on the dog, having the leash on all the time and managing her, then you're putting her in that safe position so she doesn't have to go and lunge and bark and do all those things. 
Excellent. All right, we're going to go ahead and wrap up here because I just want to take um, a minute to answer a question that came in earlier that uh, I think is very relevant and uh, important for us to cover on today's call. Uh, some of us are, you know, thumbs up right now that we heard, you know, that the beach opened in Maryland and golf courses are opening tomorrow and oh my gosh, when's university opening? Uh, I know a lot of you really are, are really itching to get back and we don't have a, a definitive answer for you right now, but I will tell you that although Montgomery County Public Schools may not be going back into uh, school this year, um, we will uh, hopefully open up uh, classes sooner rather than later. Um, ultimately, we need to see, um, you know, that uh, we are able to have everybody group um, because we ultimately do have limited space and we want to make sure that we can do that, uh, have people come to those classes the safest way possible. If we can't do it safely, we don't do it because it's just not worth it. Um, and we want to make sure that everybody's, um, everybody's healthy. That's, that's the number one most important thing. What I will tell you is that uh, we will have to uh, limit our class sizes. Um, Jessica and I uh, worked on uh, some stuff earlier today. Um, we are going to be implementing a platform for people to be able to RSVP for classes. So it is highly likely in the next upcoming weeks that you will see a notice from us, um, you know, hopefully saying, hey, you know, please RSVP for upcoming classes. Um, we will be um, definitely uh, working through some kinks as we do that. Uh, we ask that you all are patient with us. It's less than ideal uh, that we have to do it, but we want to get things going again. So uh, that's the bottom line. We'll do what we've got to do. Um, certainly, if you have questions, comments, concerns, um, Anybody who has a package with Doggy Zone, those passes are going to be extended. Don't worry about exp expiring or anything like that. Uh, we will be, um, you know, certainly, you know, giving you more than what you lost in days to be able to extend those passes. So uh, please don't let that be a concern. Um, but again, any questions, comments, feedback, anything that you have, uh, you know, we've got thick skin. Give it to us. We want to get better. Uh, you can email me, andrew at doggyzone.com. If you got some value out of today's call, we'd love for you to go on social media and, you know, share our Facebook posts with your uh, friends and family and people who you think would be, you know, benefiting from hearing what we're talking about. Um, there's also a good chance that next week when we do this, uh, we will not be doing it on Ring Central. We are probably going to just flip this thing over to Facebook Live. Uh, on the Doggy Zone page, and we'll be uh, doing all of our questions there that way. So we're still working on a couple of things, um, but we will uh, notify you all. Keep it in Facebook because uh, we try not to spam every single one of our clients with dog training, ask the trainer calls. Um, unfortunately, our list doesn't split up and segment the way that we would love it to, um, but we will be posting on Facebook, um, you know, certainly updates and that type of thing about the next call. It will be next week at the same time, 7.04 p.m. So thank you all so much for jumping on here. Again, for those that are on these calls, I just last minute reminder, you do get 15% off any virtual lessons right now. So if you have a need, let us know. Thank you all so much. Have a better than great evening. And we look forward to seeing you all in person, hopefully really, really soon. Take care.
All right. Uh, All right. Well, welcome back, everybody. <laughs> uh, nice.